Mr. Chairman, sir, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. At the outset, I take this opportunity to thank organizers of the 11th World Congress of Gastroenterology, Vienna, Austria, for inviting me and giving me an honor of chairing this symposium on advanced in the management of echinococcosis. Cystic echinococcosis is a global disease with the highest rates of human infection in regions with extensive sheep farming and include Eastern Mediterranean region, Northern Africa, Southern and Eastern Europe, Southern tip of South America, Central Asia, Siberia, and Western China. Recently, there are several advances in understanding and management of the hydrated disease which are a focus of this import, important symposium. During this presentation, I shall share with you our experience with percutaneous drainage, the so-called peer technique in hepatic hydrotosis. Our journey of percutaneous drainage of hepatic hydrotosis over the last decade can be truly called as an act of academic excellence for several reasons. First, it described and discovered a new therapeutic advance in the management of hepatic hydrotosis. By doing so, we broke the old age-old dogma that needle puncture of liver hydratosis should never be done as it can cause anaphylaxis and death. We showed that peer technique is as good as surgery in management of uncomplicated hydrated cysts with less complications and a shorter hospital stay. To do so, we followed a systematic stepwise approach to define our goals and risks and find solutions. We did a strong marketing to sell our results through conferences and publications in high-ranking international journals to answer the skeptics. We stayed focused on the results through long-term results obtained. Since its inception, Surgery has been recommended treatment for hydratosis disease and aspiration, diagnostic or therapeutic has been contraindicated due to danger of anaphylaxis and dissemination. In 1989, we at the Sherry Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences, Srinagar, Kashmir, India, ventured to treat hepatic hydratosis by percutaneous drainage. Like anybody else, we were confronted with a major concern, known risks of anaphylaxis were our foremost concerns. However, anaphylaxis had never been quantified following cyst rupture and was rare when cysts were accidentally punctured and aspirated. Peritoneal dissemination was another major risk should fluid spillage occur, and we were aware that it would need many years of follow-up to prove or disprove this peritoneal spillage in view of the slow cyst growth. We are aware that growth of the cyst is dependent upon integrity of the germinal cell layer and live protostolysis on release have a potential to vesiculate and differentiate into secondary hydrated cysts in the host. Thus, Procedure in order to succeed would need complete detachment of the laminated membrane and non viability of scolysis. We set objectives and decided to answer them in a series of clinical trials over the next eight years. Firstly, technical details of the procedure were perfected. This included entry and, ex entry and exclusion criteria, monitoring needed during procedure, types of catheters, approach to cyst through liver tissue, and scolicidal agents to be used. Next, we performed a comparative study of percutaneous drainage with drug therapy, namely albendazole. A comparative study of percutaneous drainage with standard surgical technique, namely simple cystectomy, was also completed. Lastly, we reported our long-term results of all patients treated with percutaneous drainage to answer the question of cyst dissemination and overall results of the procedure. 
were aware that of the fact that scoliosis viability and proper evaluation of scolicidal agent on scolic scolix viability would be crucial for success of percutaneous drainage. So we went ahead to master and determine scolix viability by two methods as depicted in the composite images below. In the first method, we perfected, we performed immediate microscopy of the cis fluid at the procedure site to determine scolix motility and vital dye staining either by methylene blue or eosinine. Live scolices were actually motile and exuded the dye and stayed unstained on the dye test, while dead scolices were immobile and allowed penetration of the vital dye leading to intense staining on dye test. On long-term basis, we studied viability of the scolices by animal inoculation studies in white albino mice. Cis fluid was administered either through intraperitoneal or subcutaneous route and animals were followed up for six months. Live scolices led to the development of hydrated cysts confirmed on histology and microscopy. We have reported excellent correlation between the above two methods in determined scolis viability. In search of an ideal scolicidal agent, we did extensive studies on a number of agents in different concentrations and for varying time schedule. We found that four listed scolicidal agents, namely hypertonic saline, 95% alcohol, citramide, and pavidine iodine in de defined concentrations as optimum scolicidal agents. In view of the possible adverse effects of the three agents, we chose hypertonic saline 20% for 20 minutes for percutaneous drainage in all our clinical studies. During our studies, we did not encounter hypernitremia, a possible adverse effect with hypertonic saline 20%. We at the Sherry Kashmir Institute of Medical Sciences carefully examined the patient and the cyst characteristics good and not good for percutaneous drainage. Pierre is indicated in hepatic hydrated cysts, although isolated cases in pancreas, spleen, kidney, and bone have been treated successfully by nearly a similar protocol. Lung cysts are a contraindication to Pierre as there is no surrounding host tissue to the cyst and cyst puncture can cause fluid leak and possible dissemination. Cysts which are small, less than four centimeters are difficult to treat by pair as puncture, aspiration, and installation of the scoticidal agent are difficult to perform in small cyst space. Pair is good for univesicular cysts with significant fluid component with intact and assist, and with no biliary communication. Multivesicular cysts with multiple septate divisions and few large vesicles can safely be managed by pair technique with some technical modification. Cysts with honeycombic, solid matrix, calcification, and ruptured membranes are not good for pair. Pair can be performed in a single or multiple liver cyst, even at sites which are inaccessible to surgery or laparoscopic removal. However, cysts abetting to the liver capsule or exophytic cysts are not good for pair as the puncture can cause cyst fluid leak and possible dissemination. Pair has a distinct advantage as the procedure can be performed to treat cysts in high risk patients with comorbid disease, cysts with, which relapse after surgery, cysts which have failed to drug therapy, and cysts in patients who refuse surgery. The procedure of percutaneous drainage of the hepatic hydrate cyst involves four sequential steps as defined in the alphabets of PR, denoting puncture, aspiration, installation, 
and respiration. Step one is that of cyst puncture. Here the cyst is punctured under ultrasound guidance through thick liver tissue and preferably approaching through intercostal root. Step two involves cyst aspiration immediately following puncture. Rapid cyst aspiration is done under real-time ultrasound. This causes cyst decompression and collapse and leads to detachment of the laminated membrane. The aspirated cyst fluid is examined for physical appearance, bilirubin by bilirubin dipstick test, scolix viability based on mortality and dye test, and the fluid is sent for culture and if possible for animal inoculation. A yellow cyst fluid or a positive bilirubin dipstick test suggests cyst biliary communication and leads to termination of the procedure. Step three involves installation of the scolicidal agent into the cyst cavity. Around three-fourth volume of the hypertonic saline is installed into the cyst cavity. Flow of fluid into the cyst cavity gives a characteristic snowflake appearance on real-time ultrasound. The hypertonic saline is left in the cyst cavity for 20 minutes. Step four involves re-aspiration of the cyst fluid. During re-aspiration, the complete detachment of the laminated membrane is carefully observed on ultrasound examination. The collapsed residual cyst cavity is partially filled with normal saline and the need to be drawn. The respirated fluid is again examined for physical appearance, bilirubin through bilirubin dipstick test, scolix viability based on mortality and dye test, and sent for culture and if possible for animal inoculation. Procedure success is defined if the laminated membranes are detached in toto from the cyst wall and seen freely floating in the cyst cavity and the scolices in the aspirated fluid are non-viable as determined by as determined by, by scolix viability test. If scolices in the aspirated fluid show positive viability test, pair is repeated either immediately or within 48 hours. Following pair, next day a repeat ultrasound is done to observe cyst appearances. If the procedure is uneventful, Patients discharge home within 48 hours. A monthly clinical, hematological, and biochemical and ultrasound examinations are done till cyst solidifies, following which all patients have a long term three monthly follow up examination. These four composite images depict the four steps in the pair technique. In the first plate, the cyst is, is, has been punctured and the needle track is visualized at ultrasound. After aspiration of the cyst contents, the cyst cavity has collapsed with detachment of the laminated membranes from the cyst wall. An installation of the hypertonic saline into the cyst cavity produces characteristic snowflake appearance as seen in the third picture. After re aspiration, small amount of normal saline is installed into the cyst cavity and complete as separation of the laminated membrane from the surrounding wall is confirmed. In 1993, we reported on the first ever study on the pair technique of 12 patients harboring 21 hydrated cysts. All patients were adults, had written informed consent, a cyst diameter of two to 15.5 centimeters with a mean diameter of 7.5 centimeters. All cysts had dominant fluid component. 18 were univesicular cysts and three had multivesicular appearance. Prior exclusion of cyst biliary communication or break in the cyst wall was excluded by careful ultrasound examination. During and post procedure, we enforced strict monitoring involved the anticipated anaphylaxis. This included large intravenous excess, steroid and antihistaminic premedication, ready adrenaline 
auto injector for use in case of emergency, facilities for intubation at the procedure site. Real time grayscale ultrasound continuously visualize the cyst during entire procedure. Five French 40 centimeter cholangiography needle was employed to drain large vesicular, univesicular cyst. For small volume cysts or those with multiple vesicles, 22 gauge, 20 centimeter cook needle was used. Here the characteristics of cyst fluid before and after installation of the hypertonic saline are shown. Left panel shows characteristics of cyst fluid aspirated prior to the scolicidal treatment, and the right panel shows respirated fluid obtained after treatment with scolicidal agent. Initial fluid was clear, watery, which turned opalescent on treatment with hypertonic saline. I would like to draw your attention to the cytological findings of the cyst fluid. Prior to cyst treatment, 12 of the 13 patients had viable scolices while following treatment with scolicidal agent. Only one of the 21 cysts had viable scolices, defining success of the treatment in most of the cysts. The cysts with viable scolices had a second session of peer procedure 48 hours after the initial procedure and non-viability of the scolices following treatment with scolicidal agent was confirmed. The results of percutaneous drainage in these 12 patients harboring 22 cysts were remarkable as assessed at the follow up period of 14 plus minus 15, 5.5 months from 3 to 18 months. Peer technique was effective with clinical, sonographic, and serological regression of active hydrated disease. After peer, Linear echogenic floating structures appeared in the cyst cavity. On follow up, high level internal echoes appeared within the cyst cavity, giving it an heterogeneous appearance. These became more abundant and denser until cyst cavity was replaced by high level internal echoes, and subsequently, these coalesced to form a uniform echogenic mass named the pseudotumor and eventually were not visible suggesting a cure. At the last follow-up, 16 cysts showed pseudodumor appearance and five had completely disappeared. Cyst diameter regressed significantly from 7.5 plus minus 4 centimeters to 4.1 plus minus 3.1 centimeters, which was significant. Hydrated serology was positive in 11 patients prior to the procedure, IgG in eight patients, and IgM in three patients. All patients had progressive drop in the antibody titers. At the end of the follow-up, all except one patient had a negative hydrated serology. None had a rise in antibody titers in the follow-up. The fluid of 14 cysts was anal analyzed one to 12 weeks after a peer at respiration in eight patients and at autopsy in six patients. The fluid was turbid, bile stained, and filled with cell debris, hydrated membranes, hooklets, dead scolices. Live scolices were not seen in any of the respirated fluid. None of the patients showed cyst recurrence or regrowth. All patients were relieved of clinical symptoms. They noted relief of pain and liver span decreased in 10 patients. Cystic masses palpable prior to the procedure were not, not palpable on follow. Pair technique was safe. During this study, we were pleased to know that none of the patients developed anaphylaxis, asthma, laryngeal edema following percutaneous drainage. One patient had urticaria, which responded to antihistaminic treatment. Cyst fluid had positive bacterial culture in two instances which responded to antibiotic treatment and one patient developed cyst biliary rupture at four weeks following drainage which was treated at endoscopy by sphincterotomy and extraction of the cyst material.
These three ultrasound plates depict the cyst appearance as seen at different time intervals following the PEER technique. The left panel depicts a large univesicular cyst with a diameter of 14.5 into 11.2 centimeters with intact regular laminated membrane. One month after the percutaneous drainage, cyst size had regressed considerably with a diameter of 6.5 into 5.6 centimeters and laminated membrane was detached and floating in the cyst cavity as seen in the middle plate. There were high level internal echoes seen in this cyst. At five months follow up, the cyst had regressed to a diameter of 4.5 into 3.5 centimeters and had a pseudo tumor appearance with no visible fluid component. Percutaneous drainage in cysts with multiple septal divisions and large vesicles, as soon as seen in the left plate can be done safely with modified pair technique and is successful in most cases as seen in serial in this serial ultrasound examination in this patient the procedures performed in one session and with one needle first a single large vesicle is punctured aspirated and installed with hypertonic saline the needle is then advanced to penetrate the next large vesicle and the procedure is repeated after a few vesicles have been punctured and installed with hypertonic saline, the remaining ones usually rupture from the effect of the hypertonic saline. The whole cyst then becomes unilocular with ruptured vesicles floating in the cyst cavity. The rest of the procedure is then performed as for percutaneous drainage in a univesicular cyst. However, Multivesicular cysts with honeycombing are not amenable to percutaneous drainage in view of the technical issues in the procedure. PEER has this advantage in management of multiple liver cysts placed at odd locations inaccessible to surgery or laparoscopy. This patient had six liver cysts and PEER was successfully performed in four cysts in a single session. The forces treated with PEER have detached laminated membrane floating in the cyst cavity, while two untreated cysts have intact cyst wall. The results of percutaneous drainage in hepatic hydrotosis were published in a coveted first ranking international journals, namely Radiology, in July uh, issue of. Uh, 1991. The journal is an official journal of Radiological Society of North America with an intact impact factor of 7.25 and an H index of 233. 283. The paper published in this journal has been cited 150 times since its publication. Subsequent to our initial success with percutaneous drainage, we went ahead to evaluate the role of concomitant albendazole therapy in percutaneous drainage. A prospective randomized trial on 30 patients with 33 hydrated cysts in the liver was done with PEER alone in 10 patients who had 10 cysts PEER plus drug therapy, that's albendazole, 10 milligrams per kilogram per day for eight weeks in 10 patients harboring 12 cysts, and drug treatment alone, that's albendazole alone, in 10 patients harboring 11 cysts. In the combined treatment group, drainage was performed on the 10th day of drug therapy, and a 400 milligram dose of albendazole was administered four hours prior to the drainage to ensure high blood levels of albendazole coinciding with the cyst puncture. At entry, the three treatment groups were comparable in the number of parameters, including appearance of the cyst and cyst diameters and cyst volumes. The results of this study were evaluated at a mean follow-up period of nine months. Only two of the 11 cysts 
following albendazole therapy reduced in size and had change in the echo pattern. The remaining nine cysts were subsequently aspirated and revealed viable scoliosis on aspiration. These cysts had rapid reduction in size and change in the echo pattern following percutaneous drainage. In contrast, all the 22 cysts treated with drainage in the remaining two groups had reduction in size and change in the echo pattern. Maximum cyst size reduction occurred in patients treated with drainage plus albendazole therapy. Complications with pair included urticaria in two patients, cyst infection in two, fever in three, biliary rupture in one, and drug-related reversible transaminitis in three patients. On the basis of this study, we concluded that percutaneous drainage should be combined with albendazole therapy for optimum results in the peer technique. This study was published in Gastroenterology, the official journal of American Gastroenterology Association with a high impact factor of 15.13. The paper has been cited 228 times since its publication. To evaluate the role of PR for hepatic hydrotosis in clinical medicine, a randomized trial comparing the safety and efficacy of percutaneous drainage with standard surgical procedure, namely simple cystectomy, was done. For this, we randomly assigned 50 patients with hepatic hydrotosis to treatment with drainage in 25 patients and simple cystectomy in another 25 patients. Albendazole, 10 mg per kilogram body weight per day for eight weeks was administered to patients who underwent percutaneous drainage. Serial assessment included clinical, biochemical examinations, ultrasonography, serological tests for echinococcal antibodies, jitters. At entry, the two groups were comparable in the number of parameters, including cyst appearances, cyst echo pattern, placement of cysts as seen uh, in the next slide. Patients were followed up to 19 months. The hospital stay in patients treated with percutaneous drainage was 4.2 plus minus 1.5 days, which was significantly shorter than those who were treated by simple cystectomy, where the hospital stay was 12.7 plus minus 6.5 days. The difference was statistically significant. Over a mean follow-up period of 17 months, the mean cyst diameter decreased from 8 plus minus 3 centimeters to 1.5, 1 1.4 uh, plus minus 3.5 centimeters after percutaneous drainage and from 9.1 plus minus 3 uh, centimeters to 0.9 plus minus 1.8 centimeters after surgery. The final cyst diameter did not differ significantly between the two groups. The cyst disappeared in 22 patients, that's 88% in the drainage group, and in 18, that's 72 patients in the surgical group. The difference was not significant. After an initial rise, the kinecocal antibody levels fell progressively and at the last follow-up were negative in 19 patients in the drainage group and 17 patients in the surgical group, with again no difference in the two uh, treatment arms. There, was there were procedure-related complications in eight patients, that is 32% in the drainage group, and 21, that's 84 patients in the surgical group. In the surgical group, 17 patients had postoperatively fever. On the basis of the above data, we concluded that percutaneous drainage combined with albendazole therapy is an effective and safe alternative to surgery for treatment of uncomplicated hydatis cyst of the liver and requires a shorter hospital stay. Here the cyst diameters in the left panel and probability of cyst disappearance in the right panel are compared in patients between percutaneous drainage versus surgery. The mean cyst diameters across the 10 examinations 
did not differ significantly between the two treatment arms. Similarly, in the right panel, the kaplan meier estimates a probability of disappearance of the cyst that's cure in patients treated with percutaneous drainage and surgery did not show any significant difference. These data were published in the Bible of Medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, on September 25, 1997. Long-term follow-up of percutaneous drainage for hepatic hydrotosis is of tremendous importance to evaluate the possibility of regrowth of the cyst or occurrence of disseminated disease. For this, a total of 78 patients with 95 cysts, 70 univesicular and 25 multivesicular were followed for a mean period of 45 months. In 58 patients, the cysts had disappeared and were defined as cured. And in 12, there was a pseudotumor appearance of the cyst on follow-up. Eight patients, that's 10% required additional endoscopic intervention or surgery or both. There were complications 10 patients which included anaphylaxis in one, urticaria in two, pleurofusion in two, biliary rupture in two, and cyst infection in three patients. None of the patients had localized or disseminated spread of the uh, disease into the peritoneum and there were no procedure related. These data were also published in the Bible of Medicine, the New England Journal of Medicine, on February 5, 1998, in the form of a brief communication. So, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, here we have done what has never been done in medicine before. We broke shackles of surgical dictum of ages that puncture of hydrolysis must not be done as it can lead to anaphylaxis and death. Through an extensive and very careful experimentation, we proved that aspiration of the hydrolysis can be performed safely and in fact is the ideal way to manage most of the hydrolysis in the liver. This followed through several stages, namely successfully developed the procedure of percutaneous drainage in the large cohort of patients with hepatic hydrolysis, showed that concomitant albendazole therapy is recommended as an adjunct to percutaneous drainage for hepatic hydrolysis, and we showed that percutaneous drainage combined with albendazole therapy is an effective and safe alternative to surgery for treatment of uncomplicated hydrolysis of the liver and requires a short to hospital stay. And lastly, on long-term follow-up, percutaneous drainage is effective and safe for treatment of uncomplicated high hepatic hydrated cysts. None of the patients showed recurrence or dissemination of the disease. Based on these data, percutaneous drainage, the so-called the PEER technique, has established itself as a novel therapeutic advance in hepatic hydrated disease. Thank you.